So I'm going to say a couple formalities just for the record. But today is uh, Saturday, September 26, 2015. Uh, my name is Catherine Bynum from Texas Christian University, working with the City of Fort Worth's Latino Americans 500 Years of History. Um, today we're here with Ms. Rosa Linda, uh, what is her last name? Navajar. Navajar. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate your time and, and, and just uh, willing to work with this project. So thank you very much. Thank you yeah. for inviting me. Of course. Um, so let me go ahead and ask you, can you tell me um, what your full name is, how you prefer to spell it, and uh, when you were born? It's uh, Rosa Linda Navajar, and Navajar is N-A-B-E-J-A-R. I was born on August the 8th, 1956, here in Fort Worth, Texas. Here in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember which hospital you were born in? Uh, at that time, it's All Saints Hospital. All Saints Hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who are your parents? My parents are Reynaldo and San Juan Rios. And what did they do for a living? My father was a butcher by trade. Uh, my mother was a housewife and a mother. I'm the last of ten children, so okay. that was her job. <laughs> last of ten. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So ten brothers and sisters. Nine, nine, no, nine brothers. Nine, nine brothers. Brothers and sisters. I've got uh, five sisters and four brothers. Um, five sisters and four brothers. Five sisters yeah. and four brothers. Yeah. So you're the youngest. How did that play out? I mean, See, I tell, I tell them all the time that uh, mom and dad stopped with me because they finally got it right. <laughs> But honestly, uh, I've learned so much from my brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, my mom and dad, uh, they uh, were very young when they got married. And uh, my oldest sister, uh, the oldest in the family, were 20 years spread. So she's 20 years older than me. She's going to hate me saying that. But her <laughs> name is Esther Trujillo. <laughs> very so, nice. And yeah. do you know where they came from? Were they originally from Fort Worth? They were from Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. My family originated from Strong, Thurber, and Bridgeport, Texas. We've always wanted to go back and learn the history of where we came from. Uh, and, you know, we know somewhere in Mexico. But then somebody also told me a, a while back is, how do we know we weren't here before it was Texas? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my family could have been here all along. We don't know that history and love to learn it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that's come up a lot of times. You know, we'll have a lot of people say, oh, well, the border crossed us. So we've yeah. been here for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. So you said the Bridgeport area, right? Mm -hmm. Bridgeport. Strong and Thurber. Okay, mm -hmm. and then what did what exactly did they do in, in those? Cities? Well, back in that time, they were migrant workers. Mm -hmm. My grandfather stopped that living when Swift Packing House opened up here in Fort Worth many many years ago, uh, and so that's how my father became a butcher. Uh, I've got two, three siblings that were born out of state uh, in Michigan, uh, but the rest of us were all born here in Fort Worth, Texas. Mm -hmm. But uh, my grandfather wanted to stop that lifestyle because he wanted his children to have an education. He saw the importance of that, and so um, that's why they settled here in Fort Worth because of Swift Packing House. Mm -hmm. Some of the Hispanic family um, that stayed here in Fort Worth or that are in Fort Worth, they either came for Santa Fe Railway or Swift Packing House. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And you said migrant workers. Is that farming? Farming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said you had a few siblings that were born out of state. Out of state, yeah. Which states? Uh, Michigan. Michigan? Mm -hmm. So and they were yeah. going they were back, and, back forth and forth between mm -hmm. Michigan and Texas? Yes. The older, uh, I think it was the first three or four that did that lifestyle. Uh, but there were children. Uh, they, you know, uh, and then, like I said, they stopped here to get the education that they, my grandfather wanted us to have. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you were born here in Fort Worth? Born here in okay. Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what neighborhood did you live in in Fort Worth? In Diamond Hill jar, uh, area. Okay. I grew up there. My family, I still have family that lives here. Uh, in fact, all my family lives here except for a couple of nieces that are out of state uh, based, uh, because of their family. But uh, the majority of us are all here. I think I have, uh, in my family alone, when my mother uh, passed in 2011, uh, we counted, uh, she had 30 grandchildren, 70 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren at the time. And my family continues to grow, so we know those numbers are a little bit bigger. And they're all in this area? All in this area. Wow. Yeah. What are those family reunions like? Oh, we have a quarterly breakfast once a, uh, you know, every year. Uh, every year so that we can get together uh, and just catch up with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Charles, my significant other that's with me today, uh, he came to a family breakfast so that he could meet everybody and he said that he was really nervous but he finally realized that a lot of us didn't know everybody's names either. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very interesting. I can imagine. So if I were looking at a map of Fort Worth, just for people that aren't aware, where does Diamond Hill fall? Diamond Hill Falls on the north of uh, Fort Worth, uh, across Northeast 28th Street, all the way to about 820. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And can you describe what the neighborhood looked like? I mean, back then it was a predominantly Anglo community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I grew up, in fact, in I graduated from Diamond Hill High School in 1974, and uh, there was probably seven Hispanics in my graduating class. And hello and behold, we were all related too. So uh, you know, we all lived close together. So uh, it was very interesting. But you could also see the dynamics of that community changing because by that freshman year of that annual you saw there was about 30 or 40 Hispanics in that, that class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So today, Diamond Hill is a predominantly Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you said when growing up it was predominantly Anglo. Anglo. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what were those kinds of experiences like when, when you were you know, going to school and you were you know, with, a, with probably a predominantly Anglo classmates? I mean, were there any kind of tensions at all? No, there wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I look back at that. I have a lot of great friends uh, you know, that I grew up with. Uh, and so, yeah, no, it wasn't like that at all. We, there were so few of us, and we were all, you know, community-based, and there was a community center called the Wesley Center that a lot of us went to uh, to learn how to sew or just play, and then they took us to various tours of the museums or, you know, um, plays and so forth throughout Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what kind of activities were you a part of? Outside of that, outside of that, I play. I were very athletic. My father was very into baseball, so we all played baseball. Uh, but I also did tennis and volleyball uh, while in school. Uh, in fact, in tennis, I won several tournaments. Uh, in baseball, I love the fact that uh, at Rockwood Park there used to be a baseball diamond right there off of Northside Drive, and I hit a home run. It went all the way to Northside Drive, and I will never forget my dad jumping up and clapping because I did that, and I saw the pride in his face and. That made me feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> and so what elementary school did you go to? H.V. Halby Elementary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what about junior high? Uh, W.A. Meacham. Okay. Mm -hmm. Meacham. And then high school? High school, Diamond Hill High School. Diamond Hill High School. And you said you graduated in 1974, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so what did you decide to do after you graduated from high school? You know, I knew I did not want to work in the manufacturing lines, uh, so I went downtown Fort Worth and just walked uh, and knocked on doors to find a job and ended up finding my first job at First of Fort Worth uh, downtown. Uh, that wasn't my first job, but I ended up working at the bank. Uh, stayed there in banking for 25 years uh, and stayed at First of Fort Worth for 10 years. And then after that, I switched to some other banks. I can literally say I've worked for every bank in Fort Worth twice. Mm -hmm. Bilingualism paid and I let it. You know, not mm -hmm. afraid to say that. Okay. So, yeah. So you grew up speaking Spanish? I, I grew up, my first language was English, okay. uh, but, you know, Spanish was spoken at home. And so, you know, that's where I got my Spanish from. Mm -hmm. Were you ever punished in school for speaking Spanish? No. Mm -hmm. No? No. Mm -hmm. Was any kind of bullying going on with any of that? No. That's interesting. Uh -uh. Well, you got to think about it. Back then, there wasn't a lot of Hispanics, and a lot of us at my age, our first languages were English. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were, you know, predominantly speaking English at all times in school, so it wasn't that we were speaking Spanish back then. Mm -hmm. It was a, di a different era. Okay. In fact, I did a speech um, at HSA several years ago and talked about that, talked about the barriers of the Spanish language, you know. Uh, and a gentleman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, he was the first, um, you know, generation here. His first language was Spanish, and he had issues in school with it. And so he vowed not to teach his son um, any Spanish. Well, his son was working for the Arlington Police Department and was having to go back to school to learn Spanish. So he said, you know, he felt like he felt him. And I said, it wasn't that. It was, you know, it was society at the time. There was no ESL classes back then. Uh, ESL classes in Fort Worth ISD didn't come to fruition until the mid-'80s. That late? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, population was not here. Okay. You know, the population did not come started coming here in the uh, early 80s, mid 80s, so it started changing uh, the way they taught these, to, uh, these mm -hmm. students because they were predominantly Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you said that when you graduated high school you didn't want to go into the manufacturing line. Um, well, because a lot of times when I, I saw a lot of the kids that graduated from school and that's when they went to go work for Radio Shack or Tandy, uh, the place is close to home and I was the one that's always a little adventurous and I wanted to do something other than that. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was more to, to learn and to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't go to college. So that's why I, w I thought, you know, there's got to be a job downtown. And luckily enough, like I said, I spent 25 years in banking. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that, you know, you, your dad moved your family, your parents moved your family 
um, from the migrant farm workers over to Fort Worth so mm-hmm. they could take part of, in kind of the the, uh, the meat factories here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said one of the reasons was he wanted his children to have an education. Yeah. Um, what drove him to make that decision? And what because was, what was his education? Like? His education, my grandfather's, uh, was a third grade education. And he knew that he, you know, wanted to do something better for his children and wanted to uh, have something better for them. Uh, so he knew education was a key component to that. Mm-hmm. So uh, he didn't want his children and his, you know, grandchildren to be that type of lifestyle forever. Uh, he wanted them to be better than where he was at. Mm-hmm. 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 And so that, so was a, that was a huge motivator. It was a huge motivator, and it was a sacrifice for him. It cost him his marriage. My mother, in fact, uh, she had to quit school in the third grade. Uh, because she had to raise her brothers. And so, um, you know, at that time, it was a sacrifice that they made, but they knew they were making the right sacrifice for the generations to come. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so all of your siblings graduated from high school? Uh, not all of them. I think out of the ten, there was uh, five of us that graduated from mm-hmm. high school. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And the, the which, which ones, which siblings are those? I know you have a, lot, a large I know. I have them right here. But <laughs> it was, uh, let's see, Raymond, um, Juanita, myself, my brother Adolf, and uh, I think it was Ed, uh, Carol okay. were the ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then can you tell me a little bit about the churches that you attended? When you were well, we grew up in uh, at uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. I took all my catechism classes there and so forth. Uh, and then as I got older, I ended up uh, transferring to St. Patrick's, the cathedral downtown, and because uh, I love the traditional mass, and they do still hold a traditional mass mm-hmm. there. So you grew up going to the Catholic Church pretty mm-hmm. regularly? Oh, yes, yeah. pretty regularly. And so this week has been very um, emotional with the Pope being here. Oh, yes. So, yeah. yes. Can you describe kind of what that, what that evokes for you? Oh, I, I, I think, you know, that he's here. I'm going to cry. He's here. Uh, it just, you know, he's a symbol of our church, and he's a symbol of greatness. And then plus he's the people's Pope. Uh, so you see him reaching out to the you know, children and you know, he ate with the homeless. So, you know, that's what, you know, I think, you know, we need to stop and think about, you know, it's not the money that we make. It's not, you know, uh, who we hang with or what we have as far as material things. It's about the service that we give and the service we give to our community. Mm-hmm. For sure. For sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Um, you have a lot of different community social and political organizations. Um, which ones of these do you feel like is the most important to you and why? Right now I think it's the transportation. Okay. Uh, I am on the American Public Transportation Association. I'm on their executive board. I've been on the board now for about six years. And uh, the National Freight Advisory Committee, I was appointed by Secretary LaHood, former uh, mm-hmm. Secretary of Transportation. Uh, because you know one of the things that we look at as we grow and our communities still grow, our infrastructure is not there, and transportation is key. And you know, in order for other people and community, lower mod income communities, for those individuals to get to better jobs, transportation is key for them. Mm-hmm. So we can't uh, just look at building roads and highways. We start. We start. We need to start looking at multimodal transportation. You know, whether it's high speed rail, whether it's community rail. You know, all those components and the feeders that go into that. Mm-hmm. We've got to start looking at that for our future. Mm-hmm. I love taking the TRE from uh, Fort Worth to Dallas. It's, yes. it's so much easier than mm-hmm. having to sit in traffic on 30 and just kind of wanting to pull your hair out. So exactly. Absolutely. And well, in the future with technology and transportation, it's going to be just enormous. I always say that you know we're going to be living in the Jetsons era uh, <laughs> by 2050 because of the technology that's there with driverless motor, uh, motor vehicles, driverless buses that will be able to, you know, some of these vehicles will be able to run up to 200 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the bullet train. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I forgot to ask, when did you get married? I'm not married. You're not married. <laughs> I'm okay. not married. Pardon I was me. married before, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, divorced in 2012. Okay. And then Charles and I are, are just living together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And your daughter's here with us. No, this is my my one of my nieces. This your is Elisa uh, Rios. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And then this is Edward Phillips. This is my future son. He's my daughter's fiance. Okay. My daughter couldn't be here today. Okay. She's at a uh, high school friend's wedding mm-hmm. uh, this weekend. Okay. Yeah. And when was your daughter born? She was born in 1983. 1983. And can you tell me a little bit about like what her childhood was like growing up? 
She grew up here in Fort Worth. She grew up here in Fort Worth. In and uh, we grew up uh, in the, well, still the North Fort Worth, okay. but it was the Park Glen area. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the things with her is that, you know, we, we try to give her as much as we could as far as education and better education. Mm -hmm. That's why we moved there. And she, was, she went through school through the Keller ISD system. Uh, she was a very smart young lady. Uh, we never gave her the choice of going to college because her father and I did not go to college. Uh, so she did go to St. John's University in Jamaica, Queens, uh, and she graduated in 2005. And today she's working at the Tarrant Regional Water District. Uh, she's their Neighborhood Recreation Enhancement Coordinator. Uh, she's over $42 million of trail projects. Uh, she's very actively involved and has also made 40 under 40 for the Fort Worth Business Press at the age of 28. Wow, mm -hmm. very accomplished. So, yeah. Congratulations. Well, thank yeah, you. That's quite a feat. So, um, let me, okay, so you have the American Public Transportation Associate, um, former secretary, La Hood appointee. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what that is? That is uh, what we did under MAP 21. We were looking at freight movement, and Secretary La Hood put a committee together uh, to look at freight movement across the U.S. from the first mile to the last mile. And so he asked if I'd be... A, I would consider serving on this, which I knew nothing about freight, but because of my APTA association, he asked me, and so I said yes, and uh, here I am. We were just reappointed for another two years. In fact, I'll be going to Washington on November the 12th and 13th for another meeting. But Washington, we're looking at Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very important for us to look at freight movement along with uh, consumer movement because we're all vying for the same right of way, mm -hmm. whether it's highway or rail. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then your former president, Fort Worth Insurance Chamber of Commerce, when, mm -hmm. when did that happen? That happened in 2001 when I left banking. Okay. I was the first female Latina uh, to run the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce uh, and also to be a um, president of any Chamber of Commerce here in Fort Worth. Okay. Uh, so uh, it was a, a, a you know, very nervous move for me, but then after about two or three years, I, I thought, why was I so nervous? Because I loved it. It was uh, a great opportunity. was there for 11 years. Uh, we raised the bar for economic development. We created leadership course for the next generation so that we can place them on boards and commissions so that it wasn't the same usual suspects. But we also created programs for the business owners uh, in biling bilingual programs so that we can help each business owner, whether it was the American-born uh, Hispanic entrepreneur or the Mexican-American-born or the Mexican-born uh, um, entrepreneur because we needed them to understand how to do business here in the U.S. We also won a grant from the Department of Labor. It was a $380,000 grant uh, for the chamber to do ESL, but business English. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, one of the things I always looked at, I didn't care if they could order a hamburger at Whataburger. I wanted them to know how to read a contract, how to negotiate for themselves so that they could grow their own business. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you find that's growing in here in Fort Worth is that you have a lot of... Um, people who aren't familiar with the English language who are coming here and starting businesses and oh, yeah. and, and needing to read these types of contracts. Is oh, that something yeah. that you feel like has been growing? It's growing, mm -hmm. and it, it will continue to grow mm -hmm. uh, as we you know get more Hispanics that move here from Mexico. And it's such not from Mexico. They could be from other Latin countries. So they need to understand how to do business here in the U.S. And because if, you, if they don't, they can get taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. We had one gentleman that I'll never forget. Uh, he was a uh, tall uh, Lay Tao, and he was paying two thousand dollars to a CPA to do his bookkeeping, two thousand dollars a month, mm -hmm. and a month. And so when he came into us, I ended up uh, looking at all his uh, receivables and so forth. This was a banker's dream as the ex-banker in me, uh, because he dual controlled everything that he had. So this bookkeeper was basically entering the numbers in QuickBooks, but charging him two thousand dollars a month. So we found a bilingual accounting system for him so that he was able to do his own work. Uh, and then we put him in touch with a good CPA so that this uh, CPA could just verify that he was doing this work right mm -hmm. uh, and taxes and things of that nature. Eventually, uh, the CPA told me, because all he's doing for him now is recording his taxes on a quarterly basis mm -hmm. and helping him at year end. The gentleman now has grown his business to 80 uh, individuals that lay tow, and he's got about 12 people in his office. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are the priceless moments that you've been able to help some of these businesses turn themselves around to be more successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you give me another example? Um, you know, you mentioned the one, you know, where he's paying so much money to do it. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, a lot of them are now learning that they do need to learn English. We had a session with a group of individuals to learn how to work with the city of Fort Worth. 
and one gentleman uh, in Spanish asked, do I have to learn English? I was going to get up and say yes, but another gentleman got up and said, yes. He says, I'm learning English. He says, because when you fill out those contracts and those proposals in Spanish, there may not be somebody on the other side that can read or write that. And so you're taking a chance, and that, you know, that contract or that proposal may be going in the trash. Uh, so he said that once that he started learning English, he was getting calls back, he was getting contract, he was getting work. He says, now I'm not growing overnight, you know, to, you know, be a million dollar uh, business owner, but he says, you know, in this past year he had raised, he had made over 750000 by learning some English. So I think that was a good testament to a lot of our businesses to understand that, you know, good, bad, and different work done here in Fort Worth or in Texas and the United States is all done in English. So you have to learn to do that. And are there are there classes that people are able to go to where they can learn English in oh, the yeah. formal setting? Exactly. Mm -hmm. The uh, the Fourth Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is still putting on classes uh, and works with the city is uh, the city of Fort Worth through their business assistance center. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how long has that been going on? That's been going on since two thousand one. Okay. And so is that something that you implemented? Yeah. Exactly. Because one of the things I learned when I first went to the chamber, uh, because I'm coming from a banking background. In the banks, we always did financial literacy, uh, first-time homebuyer education classes uh, bilingually. Uh, in here, we started doing classes on a weekly basis. But it's too much information to give them in, in a one, you know, evening setting in two hours of how to find your tax returns, how to set up your assumed name certificate, uh, how to set up your uh, corporate, you know, status and so forth. So what we did is we turned that into an eight-week course, and we do those four times a year. And so that is now continuing to happen with the Hispanic Chamber, and I think now they have a partnership with uh, Tarrant County College okay. to help promote that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And you mentioned a little bit about um, house house contracts. Um, did you work at all with that at, at, with the Chamber of Commerce? Oh yeah, we we always did because yeah, in banking we saw so many contracts. Well, I was a small business lender at one time too, so I worked with a lot of small businesses, mm -hmm. and so it enabled me. I think my banking background brought me to the Chamber and able to help more of our businesses. To understand contracts because contracts you know if you don't understand it you can get taken advantage of very easily and so that was the important thing that we didn't want this uh, this consumer base or this these entrepreneurs to be taken advantage mm -hmm. of and I mean I'm sure there are examples of that happening in, in oh the yes area. can you it, give me an example one from your you know I think one of the, when we did that ESL class there was a janitorial um, company um, and I can't think of her name but she had said that she got taken advantage of because she didn't read the contract right so in, she thought she was charging $600 a month, and that's what she was going to get paid. But per the contract, it's at $600 a quarter. And so she only got paid, you know, $2,400 for that year for doing work for that company. Mm -hmm. And that company took very, they knew what they were doing. They took advantage of her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and is there any way that the, is, is the chamber also involved in any kind of uh, setting up any kind of like attorneys? Well, we like have that? attorneys mm -hmm. there that are members, and so in the classes when I was there before it went to TCC, we brought in attorneys to meet with them because uh, the, the lesson that we learned about the accountant, we wanted them to see people that they could work with that were trustworthy, mm -hmm. uh, and then it also gave our members an opportunity to uh, maybe have an opportunity to visit with and, and make clients for themselves mm -hmm. as well. So, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And, um, You're on the Arts and Council of Fort Worth, mm -hmm. um, Hispanic Women's um, Network. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Hispanic the Hispanic Network? Women's Network, I became involved with them in Spanish, uh, January of 2001, and by July I became president mm -hmm. of the organization, was president for four years. Uh, they do a lot of great work uh, for Latina girls. They do a lot of mentor programs. Uh, la, right now I think it's called Latinas uh, in Progress so that they can educate them the importance of education and also provide scholarship dollars to them uh, for them to go on to college. And this last year, I think they gave out $400,000 in scholarships. Mm -hmm. So you said your role was president for I was president years? for four and a half for years. four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And what years were those? That was 2001 to 2005, I think it okay. was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, let's see. There was a medical board. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? That is a hospital here in Fort Worth. It's through the HCA system, and I'm on their board of directors. And so uh, we meet on a monthly basis, talk about you know the services that are provided and, uh, through the hospital, and learn more about the importance of uh, what is the health you know care 
that is provided and so that we can go out and you know sort of be the ambassador for that hospital but also look at certain regulations and you know so forth so the doctors and the nurses have to follow in the practices and the processes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and does that serve a particular community or is it, it serves all of Fort Worth it, it, yeah everybody. it's for everybody okay, mm -hmm. okay. yeah um, and then what is the Fort Worth ex executive round table it is uh, various executives throughout Fort Worth that we meet on a quarterly basis uh, here in Fort Worth and have lunch and have various topic speakers, whether it's uh, congressional speakers or a new CEO or a new project that's happening here in the city of Fort Worth so that we're notified and so that, again, we can uh, sort of be the ambassadors and support those initiatives. Okay, sure. And then I guess... Um and a lot of these... Uh, I think came uh, when I was working at the Chamber of Commerce okay. uh, because of the involvement that we had to be in, in you know, uh, and the visibility of the Chamber. Mm -hmm. And I left the Chamber in 2012. Okay, yeah. in 2012. Mm -hmm. And are you currently retired? Or? No. I have my own uh, company. <laughs> I have, uh, it's called the Rios Group. Uh, we uh, just celebrated our third year anniversary. It's a civil engineering uh, company. We, are, we do subsurface utility engineering and utility coordination. Uh, and basically what that is is we locate underground utilities so that when a development is happening, no one's hitting an electric line or a gas you know, pipe, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, but we work with uh, the engineering community and the construction community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. said you've been doing that for the last three, three years? Three years. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. We have an office uh, here in Fort Worth, Dallas, Austin, and Houston. Okay. All right. Well, I guess I'm going to, before I ask my final question, is there mm -hmm. anything else that you wanted to add that maybe I missed that maybe you wanted to talk about? Um, we have 27 employees uh, at the Rios Group. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm the president of the 100% owned, yes. So. Wow. Uh -huh. You're so. going to leave that off the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like talking about that's myself. That's <laughs> so, yeah, a, a lot of people keep wondering how do you, I go from a 25 year banking career, 11 years with the Hispanic Chamber, to civil engineering. And I'm not an engineer. Uh, again, so. Uh, so what made you decide to build a company on civil engineering? I, I didn't. The opportunity came to me. Okay. Um, the My chairman at the time, Brad Corandona, he was, uh, he just bought an aerial mapping company and he, his business started off as a surveying company to begin with. But he had this division of Sioux, we call it Sioux, and so he was looking to divest that division and to put more money into the aerial mapping. And so for four months, I gave him names of people to call to uh, purchase this division. And then he finally called me one day and said, the person's been in front of him all this time. And I asked who, and he said me, and I laughed. And I said, I'm not an engineer. Uh, they'll kill me or I'll kill them. <laughs> and I said, I don't think so. But it took a couple of months. And in fact, I ran into, um, I was in church one day at St. Pat's praying, trying to figure out, you know, God, give me a sign of what I should do. Because one of the things I didn't want to happen, I didn't want to be 70 looking back and thinking, what if? Right. And so um, that day when I left church, I ran into a teller of mine that I had from back in 92. She was going to school to be a teacher. And uh, she was telling me, she was, we were talking, and she said, I was always willing to take a risk. She said, you've always done that in banking because you've moved from this department to this department to this department. And then when I left, I was a, an um, associate vice president of the bank. Uh, and then I went to go run the chamber. She goes, and you know, you took that risk. And I looked at the cross, and I thought, okay, I get it. This is my sign. And so I uh, called Brad that evening and said, okay, I'm in. And so three years later, here we here we are. So, wow. yeah. Chairman. Yeah. He was the chairman of the, the, of the chamber at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I guess let me kind of backtrack because I, I realized I forgot um, a little bit of the interview. Were your parents or your brothers and sisters um, active in political movements in the 60s and 70s at all? You know, my sister was. We uh, helped, uh, to, she helped to elect the first Latino uh, council member here in Fort Worth, Luis Zapata. Mm -hmm. And so we got involved with her. Uh, and I remember going downtown and holding signs to vote for him and so forth. And I think that just sort of put the bug. But my dad always volunteered. And he always told us to give back to the community, make it better than what, what it is today. And so I think that was just instilled in all of us uh, to help. And we, you know, a lot of times back then, it was mostly in the church, uh, the volunteerism and so forth. 
but I looked that, you know, it's important for us to volunteer and make our communities better. And at the chamber, I always just tell everybody, you know, if we make our Hispanic community better, it only makes Fort Worth better. Mm -hmm. And so it goes hand in hand, but it's not just our Hispanic community, it's all our communities. So the more of the, the one thing that I'm really proud about Fort Worth is the collaboration. Uh, Mayor Mike Creeth always said it was the Fort Worth way. And people that come from out of town, they see that difference, and they see that we do collaborate. Yes, we disagree. Uh, yes, we're not always going to be on the same boat or the same page, but we learn to agree to disagree, find the compromise and the solution, and move forward. Mm -hmm. And what sorts of things do you guys agree? You know, it could be just, uh, you know, where the, the next, you know, uh, rail line's going to go, where, the, you know, uh, when Super Bowl was here, of course, that was, you know, how do we work together, uh, you know, between Dallas and Fort Worth, Arlington. Uh, so, you know, you have a lot of people with a lot of different opinions on how to do things, but we all looked at it to work, how do we work together as a region, mm -hmm. and how do we bring more businesses here to Fort Worth that creates jobs, mm -hmm. and that's the important thing, uh, and I think that's what everybody looks at here in Fort Worth, the mission is economic development. Mm -hmm. And if we create economic development here, then we're making our city richer for not just for the companies themselves, but for everyone that lives here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said your sister was active with the um, Louis Zapata. Uh, Louis Zapata, uh, because yeah. Louis is, uh, was, I think, godfather. Uh, him and Mary were godfathers to her daughter. So. Okay. But they were good friends and so forth. And when he ran, uh, again, he was the first Hispanic to win mm -hmm. council seat here in Fort Worth. And remind me again what year it was? Oh, that was probably 1976. Okay. No, I'll take that back. It's got to have been earlier than that. Maybe it's 72. Okay. So you were still in high school? When you I were was still in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So were you, were you always an active voter once you graduated? Like oh, you turned yeah. 18? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it was very important to vote. Mm -hmm. It was very important to vote. And that's what I will always tell our millennials, everyone, you know, get out there and vote. Don't just register. Exercise that right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, I guess let me go ahead and get to my final question. Um, you have, uh, I have asked on here, you know, leaders in the Latino community, past or present, and you put um, John Hernandez. Can you mm -hmm. explain? John Hernandez uh, is the owner uh, of Johnson's Press Printing. Okay. He uh, grew up here, uh, well, his family uh, is from the north side, uh, but he was one of the first business leaders that I met, you know, and so truly love to see how he was involved in the community, uh, you know, representing Hispanic business owners, but representing families. As, as a whole, and so he was a very good mentor for me. Okay. okay. And then you have Luis Zapata, who we yeah. already um, discussed, but then you have uh, Mary Lou Lopez. Yes. Mary Lou Lopez was probably the first uh, Hispanic female that I saw in a business role. Uh, she ran the Wesley Community Center okay. uh, for United Centers, and so sh and she was very actively involved in all kinds of things, you know, voting, uh, the Democratic Party and things of that nature, and she instilled that into us as well. But uh, her being the first female that I remember seeing in a suit, and uh, really and in, in just admired what she was able to accomplish. And when did you meet her? I met her probably, oh, I want to say, late sixties, you okay. know. And so, but she, and she ran that center for over thirty years, and uh, she's passed on, but her legacy continues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Robert Fernandez. Robert Fernandez is, uh, in fact, my CPA, but uh, he was someone I met back in 91 when I was president of the Hispanic Women's Network and was a key leader here in Fort Worth. He has served on probably every board and commission here in Fort Worth. He even chaired the DFW Airport Board at one time. And so, but he's one that's uh, always willing to help anyone, and he helped navigate me when I took on the role of the president of the Hispanic Women's Network. And we became good friends, such good friends that he's my daughter's godfather. <laughs> Yeah. And then are there any organizations in Fort Worth that kind of deal with um, black and brown relations together or that you know of? Any, any oh, yeah. kind of cooperation between the two? Yes. I mean, uh, when I was at the Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Dee Jennings and I with the black chamber, we worked very hand in hand because what helped their community helped our community. And we knew that. And we tried to encourage joint ventures between our businesses members so that they can also have opportunities for growth. So it's very important that we work together, mm -hmm. even on elections, you know, uh, with Ramon Romero, our state representatives, our all communities came together in support of him. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So you feel like it's been a very successful It's very successful, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Yeah. Because, again, what's good for one community is good for the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Good. Well, 
And that's my final question. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Maybe? I would just say, you know, going forward, you know, we need to look at our future and what that, that holds, especially for the Hispanic community. Uh, we have a lot of millennials, and, you know, we need them to get involved and uh, take that chance and take the risk, uh, whether it's through entrepreneurship, uh, but continue their education, and it's very important because we need them in all sectors. Uh, we are today still re hearing, this is the first Hispanic in this world, this is the first Hispanic in this world. You know, when do we stop hearing that? And so we need to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Well, thank okay. you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time and sure. your presentation and your questions. Well, thank you so much.